Vaccines. For our cats. For our dogs. Are they even needed? Find out what I'm currently thinking in this video. Are you looking to learn more about natural pet health and wellness? You've come to the right place. Click the link to subscribe to Veterinary Secrets. Lately in the mainstream media, there's been a whole lot of discussion about these guys, vaccines. Turns out there's a bit of a measles outbreak going on throughout North America. And then once again, there's a whole bunch of experts commenting on vaccines, lack of vaccines, vaccine hesitancy, what's wrong with people. Hmm. The experts then now wonder, is this going to mean more animal disease outbreaks? You've got clients that are convinced that vaccines are dangerous. Clearly they're not. Assuming we have clients that vaccinate their pets less, we're going to have way more disease. We're going to have these massive disease outbreaks. Something has to be done. So if you go on to Google, you go on to ChatGP and put in what are the risks of vaccinating my dog or cat? They're going to say risks, they're pretty minimal. They're going to say there's minimal side effects. Chance of a side effect is 0.001%. And clearly vaccines provide far more benefit than they do risks. And above all else, talk to your vet. But at the basis of it saying that vaccines in general, they're good. So is that so? And what should you be doing? There are some vaccine protocols that can list up to eight to nine different vaccines potentially given to your dog, given to your cat, almost yearly. I mean, it's a pile of vaccines. And in spite of the array of different research showing this long duration of immunity for many of the vaccines, there are still many veterinarians recommending dogs, cats come in and get yearly multiple boosters, yearly boosters. That's right, multiple vaccines given every year. Clearly, in my opinion, that's way too many vaccines given way too often markedly increasing the chance of side effects for short term and more seriously and more concerning in my opinion the big long-term side effects not all the vaccines are the same many they don't provide long-lasting protective immunity a couple that come to mind the lyme disease vaccine for dogs for it to be protective it needs to be given yearly but you're vaccinated against a type of bacteria called borella vaccines aren't near as effective against these bacteria marked increased chance of side effects leptospirosis vaccine we've seen a bump in leptospirosis throughout north america so once again it's like oh we got to get lepto back into the dog vaccine schedule. In fact, AHA, they've now actually recommended it to make it part of the core vaccine schedule for dogs. But number one, you need to give it yearly for it to have any effect. Secondly, it only includes four to five strains. There's over a hundred different strains of lepto. The possibility it's not going to be effective. Good chance, actually. And then lepto itself, it has a high incidence of side effects. So they want to include this as part of the core vaccine, may not be effective, a marked increased chance of your dog having side effects to the vaccine just to name a few for dogs you know and then for our cats you know vaccinating for fip it's not an effective vaccine vaccinating for feline leukemia virus vaccine once again you're having to give it yearly for instance honestly the proof showing to be protective is pretty minimal marked increased chance of side effects things like vaccine induced sarcomas my third point for many of the vaccines there is a much longer duration immunity that is published and is part of this core vaccine schedule. Let's take the canine parvovirus vaccine, for instance. Some study, they've shown that the parvovirus vaccine, it can last for up to seven years, like seven years. Yet initially we're giving it two or three times minimum for puppies. And then many cases, in some cases, once a year, some cases, once every three years. But if it's got a seven year duration immunity, why are we giving it so frequently? Point number four, clearly one size cannot fit all. Why is it that this one cc dose of rabies vaccine, this is the amount that we gave to 150 pound Great Dane, and we're giving the same vaccine volume to a teeny little three pound toy poodle. How can that be? The vaccine manufacturers, they claim these are what the studies say. You've got to give the same vaccine volume. And I guess that's so, right? Yet during COVID, turns out for many, many people, when they were coming to get boosters again, guess what? They were giving half doses, not a full CC, a half a CC. So it was okay to do that for people because gasp if a person has a side effect. But let's not even contemplate it for dogs. Like, how is that? Vaccine side effects, they're real. They happen more common than you think. You can have short-term initial vaccine side effects. You know, post the injection, discomfort, pain, swelling, fever. Less common, you can have acute anaphylaxis. That's signs of a serious allergic reaction. 
Here again, an animal that's all of a sudden you're going to likely vomit, might have diarrhea. They're going to have maybe labored, distressed breathing. They may appear shocky, have really pale gums, may act very weak, wobbly, a taxi. They might actually collapse. Then there's the serious long-term changes. You can have immunosuppression, behavioral changes. I've saw many dogs become aggressive, especially post the rabies vaccine. You can see autoimmune diseases. It's one immune mediated polyarthritis. You get this multiple leg lameness relating to the immune system attacking the joints. AIHA, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Here you've got the immune system attacking your red blood cells. These dogs are acutely pale. They don't have enough blood. All of a sudden your dog starts to itch and scratch. Likely he's developed atopy, that's environmental allergy. Vaccine, it's a key one to trigger the immune system inappropriately and all of a sudden it decides that these surface allergens, there's something we should react to. Now you've got a dog with a long-term allergy you need to manage. You can see inflammation within the eye, known as uveitis, that can be triggered by vaccines. All of a sudden you might have a dog that has a low thyroid. What can trigger that? You've got a vaccine, triggers the immune system inappropriately, it attacks the thyroid gland. Your dog doesn't produce enough thyroid hormone. Now you've got to treat a dog that's hypothyroid. Other glands, other areas of the body can be affected. You can get kidney disease, right? Glomerular nephritis, they're putting in these immune complex that's affecting the kidneys. Now you've got to manage a dog with kidney failure. You get myocarditis, that's inflammation on the heart. Once again, triggered by the immune system. You can get the brain nervous system affected. You can get meningitis and cephalitis, right? The lining of the brain is being targeted. An animal can become epileptic. You've caused all this brain inflammation. Now you have a dog that is seizuring. Then last but not least, it seems to get the least mentioned and the one that's on all of our minds, it's cancer. Give your cat that sub-Q rabies vaccine, sub-Q feline leukemia vaccine, much greater chance of getting this cancer called fibrosarcoma. Virtually impossible to treat, can't even treat it with surgery. And then you really start to wonder, like, why are we seeing a rising incidence of cancer in our dogs? If I had to point towards a few things to really look at, I look towards over vaccination, you know, because when we bombard our dogs, our cats with multiple antigens every year, multiple foreign bodies that we're injecting into them, like what do we think is going to happen? You get an inappropriate immune response. You have the immune system not being able to work the way it should be, allowing for things like uncontrolled cell growth, hence cancer. I advise a minimal vaccine schedule based on these three core principles. Number one, you're only giving the minimum core vaccines if necessary. So this is only going to be two to three vaccines for a dog, two to three vaccines for a cat, and that's it. Space out the vaccines, reduce the stress in your dog or cat's immune system. Consider titer testing with your veterinarian to check immunity levels before you're having to give any additional boosters. The dog vaccine schedule. We're vaccinating our dogs at eight weeks and 12 weeks for canine distemper virus, canine parvovirus. That's it. We're starting out with vaccines at eight weeks and 12 weeks. At eight weeks, we're giving canine distemper virus and parvovirus. 12 weeks, a booster of canine distemper and parvovirus. They're the two most common viral infections that are preventable with vaccines your dog is most likely to get. And then at six months, if required, you'll be giving the rabies vaccine. But don't combine them together. You've also spaced them out. And then for most dogs, a year later, you can then follow up with boosters. So a year after the last canine distemper and parvovirus vaccine, you could do a booster then. A year after that rabies vaccine, you could do a booster then. You also could as an option, just do titer testing at that time. Um, but I think for the majority of dogs to get then lifelong immunity, you wanna do those boosters at a year, a year and a half. But then after that, my opinion, that is it. That is all the vaccines. If Tula was a little puppy, I would do the vaccines. Eight, December Parvo at eight weeks, December Parvo at 12 weeks. I would do the rabies vaccine likely at six months. At a year, year and a half, what I would probably do then is do titer testing and probably not give her the rabies vaccine again because the chance of rabies in our area is pretty, pretty minimal. But for majority of dogs, you can do that, you know, year, year and a half booster, the distemper parvo rabies vaccine. Then after that, no further vaccines are needed. Vaccines for our cats. Well, number one, if you have a 100% strictly indoor cat, I, a little kitten who's never going to be outside, not going to see other animals, my opinion, no vaccines are needed. First caveat. But if you're going to have a cat that goes outside, exposed to other animals, then you need to have some vaccines. But once again, a minimal vaccine schedule. 
which would include the FVRCP vaccine, that's feline viral rhinal tracheitis, feline calici virus, the two most common respiratory viruses, along with feline panleukopenia, that's feline distemper. You're going to give that vac vaccine as a combined shot. You're going to give it at eight weeks. You're going to give it at 12 weeks. The rabies vaccine, if needed, you've got a cat who's outside potentially hunting, exposed to bats, other rabbit animals. Yes, vaccinate for rabies, but once again, not until six months of age. So you've spaced out those boosters. A year or so later, you're going to give the FBRCP booster. A year and a half later, you can do the rabies vaccine. Then after that, in my opinion, no further vaccines are needed. Our cat Cassian, he is not going outside. Guess how many vaccines he's getting? Eh, none. <sighs> Cheapers. So in summary, you are vaccinating your pets, your dogs and cats with far fewer vaccines, far less often, and primarily in the first year of life when they're much more likely to get those serious infectious diseases that are preventable with a vaccine. And honestly, that's it. Right, kitty cat. And apparently you can't believe everything that you read on Google or ChatGBT. Thanks so much for watching this edition of Veterinary Secrets of Do Your Pets Even Need Vaccines? Click up there to subscribe, hit the bell to sign up for notifications, and when you click that link directly in the box below, I can send you a copy of my free book.